Hello, Space Coast. I'm Isadora Rangel at Florida Today. In recent weeks, we have heard news about the recent rise in coronavirus cases in Brevard County and across Florida. And I assume that, like me, you have a lot of questions about what is going on and what this means for you and your family when you're trying to protect yourself. So today, Florida Today is going to try to answer at least some of those questions that you have. And I have two experts who are joining me today, and they're going to try and we're going to do our best to get all of your questions answered. Don't forget to ask them here in the in the comments section if you're watching this on Facebook. But let me begin by introducing our experts. Uh, and they are going to give us a local outlook of what's going on as well as more of a statewide. So I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Nick Moradi. He is the Medical Director of Critical Care and Pulmonology at Melbourne Regional Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Moradi. Isadora, thank you so much for having me. And Dr. Jay Wolfson, he is uh, the University of South Florida Distinguished Service Professor of Public Health, Medicine and Pharmacy. Welcome, Dr. Wolfson. Glad to be here. So we also were uh, uh, we were supposed to have a, a third expert with us, Dr. Ochoa at Parish Medical Center. Uh, but unfortunately, he's not able to, to be with us today. Um, so I want to begin by asking a very simple question. And I think it might seem very simple, but there is debate about what the answer is, is which is we're seeing a, a, a rise in the number of cases. How serious is that to you? And and specifically, if you can tell me what metrics and indicators you are looking at when you're trying to assess this situation. Sure. Would you like to go first, Jay? Or do you want me please, to? Please, please, Nick. Yeah. Sure. So in hospitals right now, we're seeing a significant uptick in the number of positive patients and number of hospitalized patients. But we're not seeing an associated increase in severe symptoms or increase in mortality. Uh, population seems to be younger. And although some are admitted to the hospitals for short or long periods of time, we are seeing the gross majority of patients recovering and being discharged home. So that means that, yes, this is kind of a, an intimidating time where we're having this huge uptick in our numbers and our diagnoses, um, but we're not seeing that same associated severity of disease where people are extremely sick and dying from the disease as much as we saw earlier on and uh, localized to the Northeast. Dr. Wilson. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing uh, throughout the state, and that's both good news and disturbing news because, as Dr. Maradi knows, and as many of you as well, uh, while the, the age grouping is, is dropping, uh, that does not mean that the, uh, the, the infectiousness of the disease is changing. So many young people are getting the illness. Some of them are coming to hospitals. We're seeing an increase in the uh, 18 to 35 year old age group coming into the hospital, but for shorter periods, the great news is that they're not having the kinds of acute episodes, but they still can pass it on to their parents, their grandparents, their aunts and their uncles. So we have, uh, we have this is a, a still a waiting and watching game as we move forward. And by the way, I, I'm seeing a comment here about why wasn't Health First invited? Actually, they were, but they do not have, have any experts available today. So I just want to make sure uh, to to let people know about that. But I'm going to ask the, the next question is that so we're now seeing younger people in the next two, three weeks. Could we see a rise in other age groups? Because obviously, like you mentioned, Dr. Wolfson, um, younger people can get other people infected. Is that something that we can expect will happen? And if that does, what does that mean in terms of you know our hospitals and our capacity? Again, I think that's part of a waiting game. And and Dr. Madari is really on the, on the very front line of watching that. So he's he, he, he sees things that aren't even reported in the news uh, and that the hospitals don't generally report. And what we do watch is, you know, the, the rates of positivity and then the rates of hospitalization, which follow, and then the rates of uh, ICU use uh, that follow after that. And then, of course, the death rates that may follow after that. But Dr. Midori is, again, right in the front line. He has a better finger on the pulse today. Dr. Moradi, what do you, what are you seeing? I mean, obviously. Well, I'm seeing that GK is very much a gentleman to be pointing all these things out for me, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, what I'm seeing in terms of we're having that age group, that 18 to 35 age group, have this huge increase in incidence, and we have to keep in mind some big picture things when we look at that number. So we're seeing a big increase recently, but keep in mind the first few months of this disease, we had very limited testing very limited types of tests. The number of tests were very limited. 
most people we were saying, if you're, if you have mild symptoms or no symptoms, stay home, don't come to the hospital, don't get tested, stay home and you'll get over it. And that was pretty effective. And um, I think that's what a lot of that age group did. But now, you know, we're further on down the path. Many different um, companies have started mass producing different types of tests. Uh, there is a huge increase in test availability. So now people are getting tested much more frequently. They're getting tested repeatedly. You know, the same uh, people in the community can be tested two or three times, uh, depending on their specific scenario. So uh, we have to keep that in mind that maybe we were under diagnosing it previously. And now we're getting uh, much more accurate numbers or closer to accurate in terms of how much this is really affecting us. And another, um, another point to keep in mind when we're addressing this same question is people aren't getting as sick from it. So yes, we're diagnosing more people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of these people need oxygen, need ventilators, need all the scary things uh, that comes along with that diagnosis. That's very interesting. I'm actually curious to know uh, what kind of symptoms and the severity of symptoms are you seeing compared to the first wave when we were seeing a higher median age of people infected? Sure. So uh, a quick note about that. It's interesting because everybody thinks about COVID as a, an upper or lower respiratory uh, tract disease, whereas there's some studies that show 60, up to 60 percent of people present with actually GI symptoms you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, things like that. So we, we really have a, a long way to go in terms of how we understand the disease. Uh, now back to the question about severity of disease and, um, you know, what's the outlook for these patients? Well, there seems to be a wide spectrum of disease severity that we're seeing. Some patients can be discharged directly from the ER or urgent care to go home and just monitor their symptoms and if let's say they develop shortness of breath or things get worse, then come back to the hospital. We can check to see if they need oxygen or further therapies. Um, other patients are admitted and they improve and are discharged within two or three days. And then there's another subset of patients where they might need to be intubated. They might need mechanical ventilation and they might end up in the hospital for up to six weeks. Um, the, the takeaway point that, that I would look at is that even in the very sick patients that require an extended recovery period, we are still seeing these patients survive. We are still seeing patients being able to be discharged back home to a normal life. And and forgive me because I, I speak very uh, bluntly and very upfront. We weren't seeing that in the first wave, which um, affected the Northeast greatly. And you know we were seeing a lot of people get sick from this, go on the ventilator, and they did not survive to make it out of the hospital. So it's it's kind of a, a different type of wave that we're dealing with right now. Is it an age a difference or pre-existing conditions? What is what is making the difference here? Well, that seems to play a role. You know, the COVID-19 virus, it affects everybody differently, just like any infection. And the age plays a big role and your comorbidities play a big role. If you're 20 years old and have always been healthy and you get COVID-19, it's likely that your symptoms are gonna be very mild. And you might not even notice that you had COVID-19. Whereas if you're 80 years old and you have um, some very severe comorbidities like diabetes mellitus that's uncontrolled, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, you might have had strokes before, it's much harder for you to find that functional reserve to fight off the infection and bounce back from it. Wow. And uh, we're actually getting a lot of engagement here on Facebook. And I actually spotted a really good question from Summer. She says, being pregnant during this time is scary. Should pregnant women be taking this more seriously? Um, I'd say, what do you think, Jay? But I would say, yes, it, it is a scary time being pregnant. Yes, be scared. Extra precautions. Yes, anything. Absolutely. If, if you have a grandma or grandpa's visiting from wherever, be extra scared. Take that extra precaution. Uh, don't go out if it's not necessary, you know, if we're worried about that. Um, what do you think, Jay? Agreed. That's from all the data we've seen nationwide, Nick. That's, uh, that's uh, one of the, 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 the newer uh, predicates to taking um, extra, extra precautions. Good. So I'm glad you said that. So now I want to talk about the kind of the latest news about COVID-19. Is it so the the well the World Health Organization says the coronavirus is spread mainly through droplets from someone sneezing or talking, and apparently they fall very quick quickly to the floor. But now uh, 239 experts have signed a letter to the WHO saying that you know hand washing and social distancing are good but they're just not enough and they say there's enough evidence that the virus could be airborne meaning that it's spread through i believe smaller smaller particles that stay in the air 
that sounded very scary to me. Um, how serious is that? And what does that mean for how we protect ourselves? Uh, Florida, uh, think, uh, you... Florida, International, Florida Atlantic University, Nick, just last week came out with a great, a great study. Uh, our engineering colleagues at FAU uh, showing the, the, the droplet nuclei spread through aerosol. And they'll, they'll, they'll shoot out 12 feet and they'll stay in the air between three and a half and six minutes, depending on the flow of air in the room. So these are, these are real serious considerations. It's not just sneezing and dropping on the floor. This stuff stays in the air for quite a while and it spreads a broad distance and hangs in the air again, depending on the ventilation. And you know, there's, there's an interesting calculus that we look at and that is uh, proximity and congestion and time. So the, the longer you are together with lots of people uh, in a congested area, the greater the likelihood that somebody's gonna sneeze or cough or scream or yell uh, or even just talk loudly. And that's going to project the droplet nuclei into the air and it will cause them, especially with a sneeze or a cough, to hang in there for quite a while um, and, and you're, you're gonna be exposed to it. So wear a face mask if you're sneezing mm -hmm. or coughing. Dr. Martin, you wanna add anything? Sure, I think that was an excellent spot on explanation by Jay and it's, uh, it, it really simplifies uh, kind of the science behind it that the longer you're clo in close contact, I mean, I can't say that any better than Jay did. I, I can speak uh, a little bit more to the to the, de the finer details of it in that we're still learning how this virus uh, functions and we learn almost daily. Like, like Jay alluded to, there was that recent study that it can project full feet, whereas we thought it was six feet and it can last up to three to six minutes. There was one study that was very limited that came out, I think in February that said, maybe it lasts up to three hours in the air. Uh, I can tell you as of right now, what, uh, what is kind of accepted in the health community. And there are studies underway to help us understand how it works and how it spreads. But for now, our guidance is that the virus is spread by droplets. So respiratory droplets, um, they spread disease um, because the droplets themselves are uh, a little bit larger. And when the droplet comes out, it usually falls to the ground. Maybe it's within a few seconds, maybe it's within three minutes. And how far does it go? Maybe 12 feet as per that study that, that Jay was speaking about. Now, airborne is different than droplet. Airborne particles are usually much smaller. Usually they're relatively dry and they last in the air much longer. Uh, the drying process often damages uh, the pathogens and the number of airborne diseases that we're currently aware of is pretty limited. You know, things like tuberculosis and, um, you know, things like that are, are, I mean, there's really not that many that are airborne that we know about right now. So if, if we find out that this COVID-19 is airborne and airborne for a long time and still remains that, um, that virulence, uh, that would be a scary thing, but that's not what uh, people are saying right now. Okay. And just so if uh, COVID-19 is airborne, so that's just so I, just so I can wrap my head around it means. So if I am in a room and I have COVID and I am say talking, exercising, and then I leave that room and then, you know, somebody else walks into that room, that means that they could catch it, even though I am not in that room anymore, depending on the time, the lapse, the time lapse between me and that person being there. Is that what that means? So I don't case. know what you think, Jay, what I would say is yes, that's what that means, but that's the question we don't know. Okay. Is it airborne? And if so, how long does it last? Is it three minutes? Is it three hours? Yeah. Is it different per person? Is it different in terms of what substrain it is? We just, there's so many uh, questions that we don't have the exact answers to. Got it. What do you think, Jay? Well, and as, as Nick said, almost every day we really do learn something new about how this virus yeah. works, yeah. and it's yeah. usually bad news. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Well, Whatever it is, it's usually scarier, okay. and yeah. it, it seems like the scarier the story, the higher up on the feed it goes. Yeah, and then we're getting some really good questions from viewers. Um, Danielle is asking, uh, how accurate are the COVID antibody tests right now? Is it worth getting one at all? Nick, what are you seeing? You I go got for stuff that's going on in China and, and, and Europe, but what are you seeing in the States? So, you know, the big question that I've had at both my facility and I assist with all of our, um, all of our sister facilities in the region is, okay, so let's say the antibody test is great. Um, they, they've been doing IgM and IgG. And just for the viewers to know, classically, IgM is indicative of more of an acute to subacute phase of the infection and the IgG is a sign that you were previously infected because it takes a couple of weeks to form those antibodies. Now, the, the real question that we're struggling with is, 
okay, so if you get an, an antibody test, and it doesn't follow the rules. IgM doesn't tell you it's acute subacute. IgG doesn't tell you you're protected. What are we doing with the results of the antibody test? I mean, let's say you've had COVID and now you know you've had COVID. What does that mean? I mean, we're there have been some studies that have come out of Wuhan and some other areas that show people are getting reinfected with COVID. Um, and the reinfection usually ends up the patients uh, ending up worse and having more severe disease than the first time they got infected. Uh, so, and how come some people don't get reinfected? I think it's important for the viewers to know that when you've been infected with it, it's not, it has not been proven yet that that gives you immunity from it moving forward. So when you get an antibody test, let's say it's positive, does that mean you're free and in the clear? From everything that I've read and I know, the answer is no. So then, you know, what's the, what do we do with that information? Dr. Wolf, you want to and add that, anything? And that's really, that, that's so important, Nick, you hit it spot on. Uh, the issue of conferred immunity, If we, what we don't know is whether even if you've had a, a, a demonstrated acute episode of the disease, whether or not you have immunity going forward for three months, six months, a year, two years. And for people who are tested uh, for uh, the antibody, there, there are all kinds of time zones. I mean, I, I, could, I could be exposed yesterday, get tested today, and I could test negative today. I won't even know that possibly for five or 10 days until I get the test results. And I could test tomorrow and test positive because the way the, 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 the virus works in my system. And there's a, I understand there's a time period between the acute um, period and, 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 and the antibody buildup period where I, I may not be tested, testing positive at all. And there are so many different test brands on the market and the FDA has just increased the sensitivity requirements for the IgG, um, they, they, they finally made those very specific today. I've been working with some of my colleagues looking at what the FDA does. And some of the test kits that are on the market, please be, be wary. Things are being sold on the internet. They're being sold at various drugstores. Uh, people are hawking them all over the place. And some of them are not FDA approved. Uh, some of them have not gotten an emergency youth authorization if they're coming from another country or even from here. Um, and if you use it, especially after the acute phase, you can't be guaranteed that the result is going to be good. There are things called false negatives. And some of the tests have been withdrawn from the market by the FDA because they were fraudulent. So just be careful which tests you're using. And remember that if you get tested today on some of these things, you may not know for a few, for a few days unless there's a rapid test kit that gives you information within 15 minutes. And we're all hoping there'll be more of those available very soon and that they'll be very reliable. That's it. That's good to know. Um, I got a lot of questions about the drugs being used to treat COVID-19. Uh, and one of them specifically was asking about the drug remdesivir. I think I said it right. I'm sorry. Might be my Brazilian accent. So um, is it available to <laughs> physicians treating COVID? Uh, and this person who asked this question, Molly, said, I have been told by physicians that Florida is tap town, which is extremely disturbing. Is it commonly used? Yeah, so it's okay with you, Jay. I'll, I'll uh, start off with this one. So there have been a handful of proposed treatments and therapies that seem to show pro uh, promise. We're utilizing them and trying to keep up to date um, the evidence as it emerges, as we strive to always follow evidence-based practices. I, I think it might be too early to safely say one therapy works better than another. I can say that the therapies that have good quality evidence behind them to show benefit are steroids, specifically dexamethasone, six milligrams a day, and remdesivir, which is the one that your viewer Molly was alluding to. Um, the patient population that show the benefit are a patient that comes in and they're pretty sick and need a little bit of oxygen, but they're not so sick that they need a ventilator yet. And I believe the reason behind that is you don't want to treat people that are have such mild symptoms that they're going to get better on their own in a few days. Uh, you don't want to give them these potent medications in those scenarios. Now, if you catch a patient that's getting a little bit sick, but before it triggers something called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, that's kind of the sweet spot. Because once you trigger that acute respiratory distress syndrome, that's kind of all bets are off. And it's very hard to stop that train once it starts rolling. Um, I understand the viewer Molly said that it is very difficult to get remdesivir. Uh, I know that in my hospital system, we still have it and are still utilizing it for the appropriate patient population on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Um, so I'm not sure where she got that information, but I haven't heard that in our, in our system or a couple of the other major hospital systems in Florida that I try to keep in touch with. Dr. Wolf, is anything you want to add? No, no, Nick's got it. Nice. Thank you, sir. We also got uh, quite a few questions about hospital bed capacity. Um, and Dr. Murad, if you can speak about what is your bed capacity right now? If you don't know the exact numbers, that's fine. If you can give us an <laughs> estimate, <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot like that. But how is capacity? Do you feel do you feel good about your at least your hospital's capacity right sure. now? Sure. So there are there. You know, I'm a, I work with Stewart Health Systems. We have three hospitals in the Florida region. Uh, we have seen a huge uptick in um, hospitalizations and the necessity of resources over those last four or five days. And uh, really over the last two or three weeks, as we've seen the incidents uh, increase, but the July 4th weekend was a big one, especially because Miami Beach closed all its beaches. Miami closed all its beaches. I think it was similar in Fort Lauderdale. So everybody kind of moved up the coast to still enjoy some beach time. Um, we still are not at capacity or critical capacity. We, when all of COVID started, we uh, created a platform uh, in terms of how to, on a day by day and even hour by hour basis, be able to adjust on the fly for where we're seeing incidents, what we need, resource allocation, things like that. So as we saw the incidents increase in Florida, uh, our nationwide partners in the same health system reallocated resources to Florida so that we could help support that. And I think that that's going on at all the major health systems uh, across the United States. Um, in terms of uh, our specific uh, health system in Florida, we still have plenty of space. If you're sick, get out there and go to the hospitals. If you need to be seen, be seen, take care of yourselves. And that's uh, really the message that I think is important to get out to the viewers. And um, I'm lo we're looking at what's happening in Texas where they're, pr they're pretty much at capacity. And I think a lot of people are scratching their heads and wondering, you know, why is that happening in Texas? And why are we, we seem to be in a much better situation here in Florida when it comes to hospital capacity. I don't know if you can, if either of you can answer, you know, why do we see, why are we in such better position? And the second part of the question is, could we end up like Texas in the future? Or do you, do you have that concern at least? What do you think, Jeff? Well, I, I think part of it is Texas opened up a little bit earlier than we did. So they had a few weeks um, uh, advanced um, opening and, and, and more folks um, spreading than we did uh, by about two weeks, I believe. So they've got a head start on us. And uh, they were far less vigilant than some of our cities were, especially in South Florida, in requiring social distancing and masking uh, than we were. So we were, we had more time than they did uh, to protect ourselves. And in South Florida in particular, I think we did a better job at the local level mandating uh, social distancing and protections than they did in Texas. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that's a, that's a great way of uh, reviewing. But Dr. Wolf, does that mean that we are two, that they are two weeks, a couple of weeks ahead of us and that we could end up in the same spot? Or do you feel that we have done a better job to make sure that that doesn't happen? I think in South Florida, we've done a very good job, much better than in, in, in Texas and Arizona and Phoenix. Uh, but that doesn't mean that those numbers won't still catch up with us. Uh, uh, Nick is seeing an increase in the bed utilization for COVID patients, which means that those are displacing other hospital patients. And what we don't want to have happen is what happened in both New York and now in Houston and Phoenix, where the, the, the hospital beds are being overwhelmed with just COVID patients and they're having to push aside cardiovascular patients, orthopedics patients. Um, we don't want that to happen. So if, if, if we're careful in Florida and we continue to control what we're doing, and as, as Nick said, we have some treatments now that we didn't have before and we're, we're doing things that are more effective now. So we keep people out of the hospital we can. And if each of us can exercise that degree of social responsibility and discipline, if we do get the disease and stay away from others and isolate, we have a much better chance of controlling it by looking at what's happened in places like Houston and Arizona, where there has not been that discipline, responsibility, and self-control. Yeah, that's very good. And then we also get also get in a lot of questions about contact tracing. That, that seems to be a, a really hot topic where, with our viewers. Uh, Tracy is asking, actually, it's a, two questions. What is the main cause for spike in cases in Brevard? I don't know if you know the, exactly the answer for that. And and are we do, are we doing enough contact tracing and quarantine 
and maybe not specifically for Brevard, but maybe what have you observed in terms of contact tracing in Florida? Uh, and by the way, the, the agency that would be best uh, equipped to answer that question for Brevard would be the Brevard Health Department. We did invite them to this town hall and uh, Administrator Maria Stahl was not available. So, but let's try to, at least based on what you have observed, how well are we doing contact tracing? Nick, are you so involved in that? What was that? Okay. Are you are you are you are you participating in any of the contact tracing management activities? No, no. I, I <laughs> notify the Department of Health, and but I, I will say is uh, if I can just preface before Jay answers, I think that Jay nailed the answer to this question with his answer to the last question. I think that's the biggest takeaway for our viewers. Everything that Jay had stated about um, being kind of cognizant of yourself, your surroundings, and your people, and uh, not going out in large groups because. That is how this is spread. When everybody was on lockdown, it did a it did a tremendous job in in uh, decreasing the incidence of COVID. And we're not saying that you know we need to go back to lockdown, but it really becomes a personal decision where if uh, everybody in the community can just kind of educate themselves as to how this works, how it's spread, things like that, and avoiding large gatherings, uh, that seems to put a big dent in this. So that would probably be the biggest takeaway. And I suspect if if we look back at the epidemiology of it. Somewhere along the line, that was lost in these cities that are getting hit the, the hardest in terms of people being out in large groups and and uh, this being kind of a, a secular from that. Yeah, so, so contract tracing uh, is an old public health technique. We've been using it for hundreds of years, trying to kind of backtrack the source of infection and find out what the source was all the way to the to the to the water pump in cholera. Um, and what happens is if you are testing positive, then you will be asked for all the places you've been, the people you've been in contact with over a period of time. And it's very important that you share that. And then the health department in collaboration with local resources, some of the local medical schools and medical students and public health schools are getting involved in this. They will get on the phone and they will call people, or in some cases they will knock on doors, which is a bit more dangerous. And it has not been as successful as we would like. But even if you get a 10% or a 15% success rate in identifying people who have been exposed to someone else in a place and you can help them understand what they can do to reduce the risk to them and to their family, we can begin to continue to push that curve down. So it's a very resource intense activity. Um, and we don't have the, the political and cultural system in this country to do what's being done in China in South Korea uh, and parts of Europe where they're using our, you know, people's cell phones without them knowing it and tracking them. That's not something that we've found acceptable. There are some voluntary systems, but the goal is to get as much detail as we can about the texture of the landscape of this disease, wherever it's breaking out so that we can know what it's looking like. And when there's a hot spot, we can go in and put the fire out before it turns into a forest fire and we have to, to shut the whole state down again. Wow. And a, another quick question about hospitals. I'm seeing here some chatter about uh, some questions about whether patients are being moved from out of county hospitals or from one hospital to the next. Uh, Dr. Murata, is that something that you have any knowledge that might be happening? I do, actually, yes. So in our health system, we have a cohort plan in place where our tertiary care facility that has the most resources uh, is where our COVID patients are going. So we can kind of standardize treatments it's the same physician leaders, the same nurse leaders, the same staff leaders that are taking care of COVID patients because there's a learning curve to it. And uh, they're on the top of that learning curve. So we have been transferring our COVID patients to that specific center now. Uh, the first time that there's been a transfer of patients, non-COVID patients from that center happened during this July 4th weekend because it was getting so busy. We wanted to make sure that everybody stays safe and stays taken care of. And we, uh, instead of having long waits in the ERs and things like that, we had patients that instead of waiting 10, 12, 24 hours for a bed from the ER, you know, the patient was getting transferred to two of our other facilities that are within a few minutes uh, transport away and being cared for there and, uh, and then discharged directly from there. Great. Um, I know I have a couple of questions about just what I call practical questions. Uh, the first one that comes to mind to me is, groceries. In early in the pandemic, I would wipe down every single produce grocery that I purchased. I've stopped doing that. But should people do that? Is that some can I catch COVID-19 
from my cereal box or from my produce that I just purchased at Publix. <laughs> Um, probably not. I think uh, caution is still is still helpful. Uh, if somebody's delivering your groceries and if they're coughing on them or sneezing on them, you might want to wipe them off before you bring them into the house. But you're, you're likely not going to catch COVID from your cereal box. Um, it probably won't last that long on the cardboard. Uh, so just again, exercise prudence. This is common sense at this point now, even though we are learning more about this disease. Yeah, I totally agree with Jay. I think it's important for the public to remain informed. I think that uh, everybody should be doing their own research, deciding what level of precautions they think is appropriate for themselves and their families. I think there's a lot of unbiased information out there, uh, specifically on the internet. And uh, if the people can stay personally informed, they can make those kinds of decisions on to what lengths they want to go to protect themselves. But uh, I agree with Jay, it would be hard to just pick a box off the shelf that's been sitting there. And, yeah, and for that to be it's a lot of work. Effective. Yeah. Um, I actually want to know personally, what are you two doing to, to stay safe? What are some of the things that you do that you have added to your daily routine? Nick, Nick is staying unsafe every day. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, you, you nailed it, Jay. I've, uh, you know, I've been working every day for the last few months. So I'm either in the hospital working at one of our three sites uh, or at my, my site in uh, Melbourne Regional Medical Center or I'm home sleeping and getting called and waking up and going back to the hospital. So it's, it's relatively simple for me, put on mask at work. I have my plethora of masks. That, uh, <laughs> when I'm not in my office, I am donning, I uh, usually two at a time, uh, depending on the patient population. So it's very simple for me. So I will, uh, I will throw that back to Jay. Well, I'm, I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about Nick and, and all of our frontline caregivers, uh, because even though they don up and they have lots of stuff, they're, they're exposing themselves every single day. And if, if somebody slips through and gets them sick, it's really going to be horrible for us. So I, I try to exercise extreme caution. I've got a, I'm over 60 years old. I'm a, I'm a stroke survivor and I've got, uh, I've had pneumonia three times in my life. So I've got, I'm a, I'm a three time loser, I guess. I'm an extremely high risk. Um, I stay at home, uh, with, with my wife and, um, uh, if we if we do go out to pick up groceries, we double mask. We don't interact. My own sons don't come to visit us at home. They stay in the in, in the in the driveway. Um, and in, until we know more about this, I'm being very cautious. I'm teaching online. I'm taking care of all of my administrative activities online. Uh, all of our, our our clinical conferences, all of our budget conferences are all like this. Uh, and that's really the, the the new world order. But but for for people like Nick who who have to see and touch patients, you can't quite do it easily like this. Um, I have a bit more of an advantage because I can do most of what I do like this, and I'm doing nearly all of it this way. Wow! And there's a there's a big debate going on about masks, and uh, obviously it's a debate that has become quite political. But uh, would you speak as experts? Should you wear a mask? or not, and do you when you're out in public? Yes, 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 wear a mask whenever you're around other people. You know, if you're walking alone on the beach, you probably don't have to wear a mask. Uh, but if you're approaching a crowd or if you're in any congested area where there are three or five other people within 12 or 15 feet of you, you should wear a mask, get into the habit of doing it. It's to protect them. You're being a responsible citizen and you're being respectful of them and you hope they do the same for you. So it's better to wear a mask than not to wear a mask whenever you can. And you're seeing a lot of people driving with masks on us because they're not touching them and taking them on and off, which is probably a good thing to do to protect themselves. Hmm. Dr. Marotti. Yeah, that's a great call. Great call, Jay. I, I agree. You know, the mask only helps. There's really not much downside to wearing masks other than sometimes it's uncomfortable or it gets stuffy, but they do help prevent the disease transmission. And like Jay said, if you're alone walking on a beach, enjoy the air. But if you're going out somewhere and it doesn't hurt, you know, it's a personal decision. But from everything we see, it is probably the number one thing in terms of prevention, that and hand hygiene and uh, prevention. And actually, my, my follow up question is, OK, wearing masks, obviously, I think we're all on the same page, wear them, but then taking them off and then disposing of them. What should I do if I wear a cloth mask? Should I just put it in the washer as soon as I get home. I leave them in my car because I, I tried to leave them in the sun. Am I doing the wrong thing and putting myself at risk by doing that? Tell us you know, how to get, how to take it off and how to uh, throw it away or wash it or whatever. Well, some masks come with instructions. 
and follow the instructions. If you're wearing a plain bandana, a cotton cotton mask, uh, it'll wash it out like 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 your socks. You wear your socks, you wash them the next day. Um, if you're wearing a, a, a disposable mask, dispose of it. Uh, some people are having difficulty getting a hold of masks. You can wash some of the ones you may have in a mild detergent and let it sit in the sun to dry. Uh, again, this is this is fairly commonsensical stuff. Keep make sure you have enough that if you need one in your car, it's there. Uh, that you always have one available for you, uh, and that um, if if you've been sneezing on it or coughing on it, or if it's gotten really dirty, if you can't clean it up, get rid of it because it's probably not doing other people any good. If you can sneeze right through it or cough right through it, and if others can can get it, and sometimes you lose the protection around the rims as well, which is where most of these masks masks fail. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think Jay nailed it. If you uh, a at the end of the day, you should do something with the mask. You should either clean it or if it's a disposable, dispose of it and get another one. If you're sneezing and coughing so much that it gets moist throughout the day, that's the time to take it off and get a new one. Um, and there are some questions about the virus possibly mutating. I don't know if I don't know if you guys are able to answer this, but uh, this is coming from Nick. The CDC previously stated that the mutation of COVID-19 was minimal and low risk, yet we're seeing more additions of symptoms and how it how it affects people. Is there any concern of it further mutating symptoms? So I think that mutating a virus that mutates is different than the way that it's affecting our bodies. Yes, we're, we're seeing that this, uh, a lot of people presenting with GI symptoms as opposed to presenting with respiratory symptoms initially, but that doesn't mean that we, that that wasn't happening before. It just means we weren't noticing it before. Keep in mind, this is a novel virus for us and we're still trying to figure it out. We're still trying to figure out how it works, what it affects, what body system it affects. And keep in mind how many hundreds, thousands of viruses are out there. A lot of viruses lie dormant in all of our body systems at all times, and they don't really come out until we're immunosuppressed, whether that's medically or uh, due to some other disease process. So uh, viruses are around. Viruses do a lot of different things in different people. So to say that you know, the virus is mutating more aggressively and that's the reason for the GI symptoms, I wouldn't link those two things uh, that quickly. Agreed. And um, now I want to talk, uh, explore, uh, kind of brainstorm about how, what our new normal should be, should be moving forward. The governor has uh, said it time and time again that he is not shutting down the state again. So, which means at least to me that we're going to have to figure out a way to stay open and protect people and lives. What are your thoughts? You know, how does how do we go back to normal without obviously hurting the economy? Any thoughts on how to do that? And you know, how do we even do this? Is it possible to return to normal without risking new infections? Well, it's a door. You know, we we don't have a vaccine yet, and uh, when we do, we'll have a vaccine very likely, and it may likely. Be, be useful for the, the lowest risk populations. It takes years and years and years and years and years to develop a vaccine because you give somebody a shot of something in and then three years later, they can have an adverse reaction. So um, the vaccine, we don't have a vaccine. We don't have a, a, a good treatment yet. And, and we don't even know if herd immunity is possible because we don't know if it confers lifetime. So for the time being, whatever normal is, is undefined because we still don't know how this virus is going to affect us three months from now, six months from now, or three years from now, if it's still around and we haven't found anything. No, we still haven't found the treatment, a, a, a vaccine for AIDS, but we've gotten a fabulous treatments for it. So the bottom line for now, for all of us, is we can't afford to close down the economy. We can't afford to get people losing more jobs. Business is going out of business forever. Divorce lawyers are having a heyday. Domestic <laughs> violence is increasing. Bankruptcies are increasing. When we come to the fall, we're gonna be experiencing another round of regular influenza. The 17 year locusts are coming in the fall as well. <laughs> it's an election year and we're gonna have hurricanes. For the, next, for, the, for the next six months, this is gonna be a tumultuous climate and there's a lot of uncertainties. The only certainty that we can have is within ourselves. And it's taking responsibility for our daily behaviors, wearing a mask, washing our hands, exercising good hygiene, being respectful of other people and just exercising common sense 
which is the most important thing. There are no politics here. There's only good medicine, good public health, and good common sense. And if we recognize that, then we, this becomes like a Smokey the Bear thing, you know, only you can prevent COVID. <laughs> Dr. Moradi, would you like to add anything? I would like Jay to patent that catchphrase because that sounds perfect. <laughs> <laughs> the forest I, uh, people got it. I the think, forest people got it already with Smokey the Bear. <laughs> that's right. I think that Jay nailed it. I mean, I was going to mirror his exact same sentiment. It doesn't take a, a governor to shut things down or mandate this or that. Uh, there is personal accountability. We're all community members. We all live and work with each other. Uh, the important thing is to that we kind of know it, what helps, what works, and we function as a society we can function together we can go out and do business and do all of these things but do it in a somewhat more protected way at least for the for the time being wearing the mask not gathering in large groups all these kinds of things everything that jay said was dead on uh, i i i mirror that sentiment and i got a really good question here from jamie uh do you think it is safe to fly if wearing a mask i think a lot of people are probably wondering that i am wondering that myself my whole family lives in Brazil and I feel I would never be, I won't be able to see them for the next two years because I do not want to sit on a plane with a mask for eight hours. But if I'm wearing a mask, does that mean I'm safe on a plane? What is your educated guess or if you know that? You know, Isadora, it depends in part on your risk factors. I don't think I could take a risk because of my health risk factors of flying on a plane. Uh, I'd be much more susceptible to the slightest thing. My resistance would go down and then I'd, I, I, I'd, I'd go down even further. Uh, for other people, if they have to travel these days, if you wear a mask um, and protect yourself, you're, you, know, you, 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 you know yourself better than others. Um, I think it's still risky. The airlines are opening up. They're putting people three to a seat, which some of us in public health find curious, at, at least. Um, you know, there's no risk-free environment, but you don't have to go out of your way to create more risk, unless you have to. Dr. Moradi, want to add anything? Yeah. yeah, so I think that there are two parts to the question that you ask. And I think Jay uh, addressed the first part, which is what's the risk to the person flying? And that has to do with your comorbidities. And should you catch COVID, what, how risky is it for you to catch COVID? You know, you have to assess that risk day-to-day -day basis and depending on who you are, what comorbidities you have, things like that. The other part to your question was how risky is it to catch COVID? Um, and I think that a lot of different factors play that role when it comes to flying. How busy is the airport? How many people do you have to pass in close proximity to? Uh, do you sit next to somebody on the plane or is it just you on the plane and nobody else is on the flight sitting three to a seat? That is a, an interesting uh, approach that the airlines might be having, uh, especially when everywhere else we're doing social distancing of six feet. And, you know, if you go to a fast food place or something, everybody's spacing out tables, restaurants, things like that. Um, so I think there are way more factors that make it uh, fall kind of into the gray area in terms of the question of whether it's safe or not. I think the one thing that I can safely uh, say with confidence is if wearing a mask on its own protects you 100% from everything while flying or otherwise, I think it is safe to say that is not the case, that just simply wearing a cloth mask protects you from everything COVID related it is not an accurate statement. Wow, which uh, Nick just asked something about masks and uh, maybe you can expand a little on that. It said, if you can't acquire or afford an N95 mask, which are obviously hard to come by, what do you believe is the next best alternative or is it simply user's choice since any mask is better than none? Any mask is better than none. Um, multiple layers are better than one layer. Quilted layers are better than plain cotton. And um, if it, it, and, and where you're going with it is important as well. If you're in a mildly congested area or a lightly congested area, you can probably get away with a bandana or, a, or, or multiple sheets of, of cotton. If you're going to be in a very congested place, uh, flying on an airplane, for example, uh, standing in line uh, in, in an airport, uh, a, a, much, a much more uh, effective mask, an N95 mask, is going to be what you want. Yeah, anything is better than nothing, and the more the better. You know, when this thing first broke out in China, I was, uh, I was reviewing some documents, and I was looking at pictures and things, and, uh, yeah, very, very innovative. 
people, they, they took uh, those big jugs that you use at water filters and they cut, you know, when it sits upside down, they cut the top off and put that over their heads. And that worked almost as like an isolation wow. chamber for their breathing and very functional and it works, especially in a, an area that's as densely populated as Wuhan, China, all these places. So the, the thicker, the better, the more layers of protection, like Jay said, the better. That's very interesting. Not, not sure we're going to see a lot of that here in Florida, especially being so hot. But uh, I have one, a couple of more questions here, and then I promise I'll let you go. Uh, Angie is asking your thoughts about opening schools at full capacity. How should we go about reopening schools? Should we do it at full capacity? Should we? I've, I've heard some school districts are doing stacked days or where you go to to campus maybe two or three times and then the other two days you stay at home. What are your thoughts on that? We're all struggling with this and every school district is developing a separate plan in this county and the state is attempting to provide some general input but for the most part it's really locally controlled both in the uh, K to 12 and even at the university level. Um, and there are really several issues here. Uh, as, as we learn more going forward in the next few weeks, if the disease progresses substantially, God forbid, um, we'll have to pivot again and figure out how we're going to manage this. Uh, if, if we send our young children to school so that their parents can go to work, uh, we, we'll have to find a way to place them in areas where they're not close enough to each other to infect one another if, if someone is positive. The greater risk as well as the teachers and the staff in the schools, uh, they're going to have to be there. So we're all talking about some form of, of pivoted approach to education. The youngest students are going to have difficulty learning at home. Uh, they're likely going to have to be, if they're going to go back to school, they're going to have to go back to a location so that their parents can go back to work. The older students and the college students, we're working all kinds of creative plans to do that. Uh, uh, space, classroom times, um, going into late evenings, early mornings, um, a combination of uh, actual time and, uh, and, and, and uh, video time like this. And we're gonna have to learn as we go with this because you know we've, we've never done it before. But we do know that for the higher learners, for high school and above, this kind of venue really works. And uh, we're gonna have to rely upon it more and more for those things that don't absolutely require presence in the classroom. For the younger kids, it's gonna be a challenge. Yeah, this is a very complex issue. And I think Jay touched on some of the most important points. And, you know, just thinking, all right, let's say that we keep the schools closed for the for the younger, the younger crowd, you know, K through 12. Uh, parents need to work It puts a tremendous strain on families and the teaching and the spending time and who's watching. And um, let's say that the schools are closed, but then you put your kids in daycare. I mean, what was the point of all that? You know, yeah. they're still getting that same exposure. So it's it's really it's really a tough uh, situation because it's so complex and there's no easy answer. And uh, as with all the difficult decisions I have to make in the day to day practice and critical care and you know working out at these hospitals, I'm glad that that's not one that I have to tackle. And two more and two more questions. One for Dr. Murati. Uh, uh, Jane is asking, can you address the PPE situation at the local hospitals? Are we ad adequately protecting our healthcare workers here? So I can't speak to all of the healthcare systems, but I know that for my health care system, which is Stewart Health Systems, we do still have adequate supplies of PE. We still have backup supplies. Um, we have, uh, like I said, we have the infrastructure in place now where we are addressing the, the COVID on a daily basis. And wherever the COVID incidence is surging and where, wherever we need the resources at that moment, we're doing a great job of being able to redirect resources there. Uh, the state has been helpful. And I've also been in touch with colleagues that, uh, in leadership positions for uh, HCA hospitals. And my understanding is it's the same there. They're also able to keep up with the PPE need. I can't speak to any other hospital systems because they don't have any uh, interactions there. And Dr. Wolfson, someone was curious about double masking and she, Marilyn is asking for clarification. Can you explain how that works? What kind of masks do you, do you double, I guess? Well, you, you, you could put two bandanas on. Uh, you can take even the, the, the three ply blue uh, uh, 
uh, devices that you see a lot of people wearing. Just wear two of them, string two of them around your ears, or put two two cup masks on your face, just to give you extra filtration. What you're doing is you're tightening up the amount of space that droplet nuclei have to go through in order to get out or others to get in, which is less of an issue. Awesome. Well, I think this is it, Dr. Murad and Dr. Dr. Wolfson. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, you guys were great and so much expertise. I'm sorry, we got a lot of questions, way more than I anticipated from viewers. I tried to get to all of them. Uh, and I'm sorry if I couldn't get to yours specifically, you can email it to me at irangel at Florida Today. I would forward to Dr. Wolfson and Morati. I'm sorry, I put you putting you both on spot. Uh, and I'll try to get you answers. But thank you so much again for joining us, doctors. And uh, this was very, very informative. And I'm sure it's, it helped a lot of people. Well, Zora, thank you very much. And Nick, I want to give special thanks to you. You are, you, are an, you are a superhero. You are not just a physician providing care. You are providing care to COVID patients. You are right in the thick of it. And um, please stay healthy. Well, thank you so much, Jay. That means the world to me. Just, you know, one thing a month gets us through, you know, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's, you know, it's not me. I, there's a, at every hospital you go to, there's a huge team of people and every one of them are heroes. The secretary that you meet on your way in, the technicians, the nurses, the radiology techs, uh, the administrators that help keep in, keep the place running. I, I mean, really, uh, this COVID has been a tremendous opportunity for us to, you know, kind of, I don't want to get on the soapbox and say sacrifice, but to show, you know, what we do best and to have the opportunity. You know, I, I lead a lot of our, our huddles and meetings at these, at these hospitals. And uh, it's amazing that something like this can happen and it's healthcare workers we have the opportunity to really kick it into full force and help people. And that does come with an element of risk, but it's a risk that we're all willing to accept to, to provide for our community and help them in this time. So I appreciate you, Jay and uh, Isadora, both inviting me to join in this town hall so that we can talk to the community and address some of their questions and also um, address how appreciative we are for all the healthcare employees that are going to work every day, knowing the risk to themselves, knowing the risk that they bring home to their families and all that. So uh, very much appreciated. Awesome. And thank you to all healthcare workers. But by the way, Marisa said, uh, thank you for mentioning, mentioning radiology techs. Uh, again, <laughs> go to, if you want to read more about our coverage of the coronavirus, go to floridatoday.com. Please consider subscribing so we can continue the, to do the high quality work that we do here. Just go to Florida today for slash subscribe. And thank you once again. Be safe. Thank and be you, well. Isadora. Thank you, Jeff. Bye, Nick. Be well. Bye.